This is a general disclaimer. Redlands Community College attempts to have the most accurate and up-to-date information listed in its content and delivery. However, your education is your responsibility. Redlands Community College or Roy Smith makes no guarantee in the accuracy of this information in this video and accepts no liability for the informational video. The information expressed is strictly the opinion of the author and the presenter, which is listed in the reference near the end of the video. This information is designed to supplement your own education or initial education and should not be used to replace any current academic program you're enrolled in. View the information and content at your own risk. Thank you. All right, this is going to be Chapter 10, Drugs Used to Treat Cardiovascular Emergencies, and this is going to be Part 2. And we're going to talk about analgesia or pain relief. Uh, drugs on this list are going to be butorphanol, fentanyl, meperidine, morphine, nubane, and nitrous oxide. And a little explanation here on how they actually work. That they have essentially two pathways. So, and your brain is the perceiver of the pain. So, when a drug agonizes the opiate receptors, what that does is that adjusts your sensory input to pain. So, it adjusts pain so that it, you perceive it differently. Now, the secondary pathway is, is, is as a CNS depressant. And these would be through the kappa receptors up here. And this is also a perception of pain. So pain occurs if you have an opiate analgesic on board. The dorsal horn of the spinal column that receives the pain then thereby is adjusted. And then the kappa receptors would adjust your pain as you perceive it even more in the brain. So butorphanol, general knowledge, and in, remember in general knowledge drugs, the only thing that I really need you to know is the mechanism of action because you may see patients that are actually on this. So Stadol is the trade name. Butorphanol is a generic. Mechanism of action, the narcotic agonist analgesic of kappa opiate receptors and partial agonists of MU receptors. So this works in your primary pathway and your secondary pathway. Inhibits ascending pain pathways, which causes alteration in response to pain, produces analgesia, respiratory depression, and sedation. Fentanyl. This is a primary care medication. So please know everything about this one. Generic on this is fentanyl. The trade name is sublimase. Mechanism of action, stimulates central nervous system opiate receptors, producing systemic analgesia. One milligram weight basis of fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Its duration of accident is shorter than morphine or hydromorphone. An IV dose of 100 mics of fentanyl is roughly equivalent to an IV dose of 10 milligrams of morphine. Fentanyl is less emetic, affects another narcotic analgesic. So, this is a very synthetic drug. It lasts a little bit shorter, which makes it more ideal for EMS. It is more potent than, uh, than morphine or Dilaudid. And essentially, as far as emetic effects, some of our other narcotic analgesics, like Dilaudid and like uh, morphine, tend to give us an emetic effect or make us vomit. So this one here re uh, is a little a little bit less than than most um, opiates are. The adult dose in this, one to two mics per kilogram, uh, IVIM, every 30 to 60 minutes as needed for pain. Uh, pediatric dose is 0 0.5 to two mics per kilogram per dose, IV, and this would be every one to two hours. Contraindication on this, since these work both in the primary and secondary pathway in the head, hypersensitivity, uh, toxic Toxin-mediated diarrhea until toxins are cleared. Paralytic ileus. Respiratory depressions. If you already have respiratory depression, do not load a bunch of fentanyl on there. It's going to give you an untoward effect. Uh, acute or severe bronchial asthma within two weeks of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And this would be through, from your secondary pathway there that we were talking about earlier. Transdermal or management of post-op mild intermittent pain or opiate naive patients. 
What that means is, is you haven't really been exposed to opiates before. That this is going to feel like it has more punch than than most medications. This isn't a Tylenol. Uh, Non-opiate tolerant patients uh, consider, and those are relative contraindications. Um, ease them into it if you're giving it to them, uh, and they might be okay with it. Explain to them that they're going to have a little sensation. Their chest may feel a little funny and warmth for a second. Uh, pharmacokinetics, this is on set immediate, and the duration is one to two hours. Excreted in the urine of feces. Uh, meperidine, also a primary care drug. Uh, generic on this is going to be meperidine, and the trade name is going to be Demerol. Mechanism of action. Narcotic agonist analgesic of opiate receptors. Uh, inhibits ascending pathways, which cause alteration in response to pain. Produces analgesia, respiratory depression, and sedation. Adult dose on this is going to be 50 to 100 milligrams. Uh, I am sub Q P O, slow IV, uh, every three to four hours for pain. Pediatric dose, one to two milligrams per kilogram, every three to four hours. Max dose is 100 milligrams, or the adult dose. Contraindications, meperidine should not be given to patients with hypersensitivity to meperidine or its bisphylates. Head injury, undiagnosed abdominal pain, do not use meperidine in patients receiving monoamine oxidase inhibitors, may cause patient to have a fatal reaction or fatal arrhythmia. Pharmacokinetics, rapid onset, duration is two to four hours, and it is excreted in the urine. Again, this is a pain medication. Uh, we used to use this if we're going to use morphine for chest pain or fentanyl for chest pain and the patient was allergic to either it gave us another option so we most of the time would carry this medication as an alternate to our pain and chest pain medications. Uh, morphine primary care generic on this is morphine sulfate and the trade name is Duramorph mechanism of action uh, narcotic agonist analgesic of opiate receptors inhibits ascending pathways causes alteration in response to the pain, produces analgesia, respiratory depression, and sedation, uh, causes cough suppression, that's supposed to be a G, causes cough suppression by acting centrally in the medulla, and this would be the secondary pathway. So that secondary pathway gives us a little bit of cough, cough suppression. Adult dose for pain, most places will cap this at 2 to 10, milligrams, but our dosing here for this book goes up to 15. So 4 to 15 milligrams very slowly. Do not give a dose like 10 or 15 milligrams in one setting. Incrementally drop them into it. An example of this is if I was going to give them 10 milligrams total, I would start off at 2 and then give 2 more and then give two more and see where I have altered their pain. So if their pain was well up here whenever I started, where did two milligrams get me? Where did the second two milligrams get me? And so on, on a scale of zero to 10. That's why that's so important. If they have 10 on a 10 scale, how much is my two milligrams bringing them down on that pain scale? <clears throat> Uh, so adult dose, 4 to 15 milligrams, IV, IO, IM, sub-Q, maximum of 15. We use it for ACS and CHF and pulmonary edema as well, 2 to 4 milligrams, slow IV over 1 to 5 minutes, every 5 to 15 minutes, up to 10 for pain. Pediatric dose, 0 0.5 to 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, very slowly. This would be IV, IO, IM, or sub-Q. Contraindications on this, do not administer morphine to patients with hypersensitivity to the drug. Hypotension, respiratory depression not associated with pulmonary edema, head injury, undiagnosed abdominal pain, do not administer to patients who are taking depressant drugs. They're going to potentiate one another. So you're going to get more bang for your buck out of one of the medications. Pharmacokinetics, onset 15 to 30 minutes, the duration up to 7 hours, and this is excreted in the urine and feces. Nubane, general knowledge, so again on the general knowledge drugs, all I need you to know is the mechanism of action. Narcotic agonist, analgesic of capiate op opiate receptors and partial antagonist of MU opiate receptors inhibits ascending pain pathways, which causes alteration in response to pain. Produces analgesia, 
respiratory depression, and sedation. So what this medication does is it works on the kappa receptors, which were the secondary pathway. The primary pathway, the MU receptors, is where things like dilated and morphine works. So this medication alters it from the brain so it actually works up here and from the dorsal horn of the spinal column where you're receiving pain or MU receptors it actually is an antagonist so let me explain that so what that means is is it is going to block that receptor instead of stimulate it. Now what that does is this is like giving somebody this controls the amount of pain relief they can have for the duration of the drug. So what Nubane is, is it would be like giving somebody a kappa receptor. That's the only way now that they can alleviate pain and in the same breath giving them something like Narcan. And what Narcan does is it blocks these so that it's a competitive blocker so that's what the antagonistic effects of this drug would be so what that does for your patient is it caps the amount of pain relief they can they can have the the medicine here caps it at what Nubane can give that means if we added on more medication and more pain medication with this we would only get pain relief up to what new bane would be given problem with that is is the duration is three to six hours so that means for six hours i've altered the way this patient perceives pain but i've also blocked my mu receptors so most ems services some ems services do carry this and some do not so um, most of the EMS services, if you're going to use a pain medication, there should be no cap on it. Uh, nitrous oxide, general knowledge drug, and that again is just mechanism of action. Nitrous oxide is a CNS depressant. Uh, inhalation of a 50% mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen produces CNS depression as well as rapid pain relief. A nitrous oxide oxygen mixture produces rapid but reversible pain relief very simply this alters the way that you would perceive pain this would be from the secondary pathway adult dose on this 20 to 50 percent concentration is self-administered all right antiplatelet aspirin and plavix and just to clarify something here for a second nitrous oxide is essentially a medical grade whippet uh, whippets have nitrous oxide in them for whipped cream whenever people abuse uh, whipped cream dispensers uh, a street drug essentially or the abuse of, of uh, nitrous oxide that's in the whipped cream the nitrogen makes it nice and fluffy uh, so this is a medical grade version of it we see it used a lot in actual uh, dentist's office as an alteration of pain or alteration of their LOC so that they can pull teeth and things like that. Uh, antiplatelet, we're going to talk about two in here and this would be to stop platelet aggregation or them clumping together aspirin and Plavix. Now how platelet therapy works is off of something called a ligand and let me kind of explain that here for just a second. So a platelet is essentially a piece of tissue there is in the formed elements of the blood and this tissue's job is to be sticky and the ligand is what I'm drawing right there on that platelet or a protein chain that will stick to another platelet now the more that these clump together and the more that they aggregate the bigger the clot becomes and these would have all kinds of these are all platelets sticking to one another this is why we worry about this kind of stuff in an acute myocardial infarction or acute heart attack because if one platelet initiates the sticking together procedure then the others will follow and this makes the clot bigger and bigger and bigger so 
we definitely have a few things that attack these that are even on our truck. One of them being aspirin, which works through thromboxane A2. This inhibits glyco-2B3A protein. The other one is, as we'll see patients all the time, on Plavix, and it works through adenosine diphosphate. Again, powering this little protein chain so that it can stick to another platelet. So aspirin, mechanism of action, inhibits the formation of prostaglandulins. Prostaglandulins uh, pretty much kick off inflammation involved with the production of inflammation, pain, and fever. This also contributes to an analgesic effect. Antiplatelet, powerful inhibition of platelet aggregation sticking together by blocking the formation of thromboxin A2. And which causes platelets to aggregate and arteries to constrict. So if someone's having an MI, what we don't want to do is we don't want their arteries to constrict, decrease the lumen even more, and we definitely don't want the platelets stacking up on top of one another. Adult dose on this is going to be 160 to 325. We give it in the form of 81 milligrams a pop, baby aspirin generally. And please remember, if we put four of those to a patient or three of those to a patient, or however many our protocol actually says, if we were at the lower end of this, an example of this would be I would give two of them. Well, instead of 160, I am actually at 162 milligrams. So please be sure you document appropriately whenever you're administering baby aspirin that's chewable. Pediatric doses on this, uh, precaution in children with viral illnesses, and no aspirin products should be given to kids with viral illnesses because it could cause Ray syndrome. We'll talk about that more in pediatrics. Contraindications, hypersensitivity to salicylates, which is, that's what aspirin is. Bleeding disorders or thrombocytopenia, avoid during pregnancy, especially during the third trimester, because of potential for adverse effects on the fetus and the mother. Pharmacokinetics, whenever we give aspirin, onset is going to be about 5 to 30 minutes, and the duration is going to be about 2 to 3 hours, and this is excreted in the urine. Plavix, this is going to be general knowledge, and generic in trade, please pay attention to those. And mechanism of action on this, and we talked about this in the slide, ADP inhibits glycoprotein 2B3A complex, and this would be the initiation or those platelets wanting to stick together. Again, general knowledge drug. Anticoagulants and heparin is who we're going to talk about in here. Now, whenever we look at heparin, here's warfarin, here's heparin right here, antithrombin 3, it would be how it interacts. And then we'll talk about TPA here because this is the next one as well. So essentially what these medications do, warfarin is rat poison, started off as rat poison. So warfarin and heparin. Heparin does a little bit one more here, but I usually give a lecture on this that whenever your body's trying to make a clot, that it essentially forms either the thrombi or the substance that hold the thrombi together or make them stick as we have bricks we have essentially mortar and then we have emergency patches and the emergency patches are essentially the platelets so if we're trying to build a clot those are the components to it in this clot also we have sticks of dynamite in here because the dynamite itself may need to break down the clot. And that's this down here. Okay, so let me explain each one of these. So thrombin or thrombus is the bricks. And these are the two phases of it, prothrombin to thrombin. The mortar would be fibrinogen to fibrin, and that's what holds all these thrombuses together. And the emergency plate, uh, patches we talked about are the platelets. So as long as we form the glyco-2B3A protein, those become very sticky. We can attack that in two ways via ADP with Plavix. And there's multiple ways we can attack that. All of those drugs that we looked at in that first slide set there are platelet inhibitors. 
or we can do a through thrombox in A2, but those are the two that we picked on this list. Um, so warfarin essentially works through factor 9 and factor 10, thereby inhibiting the formation of prothrombin to thrombin. Warfarin, and that's Coumadin. And essentially heparin is antithrombin 3 which essentially stops the formation or brings about more antithrombin so in the last formation or the last little bit before this becomes thrombin or the brick it kind of stops that process. Warfarin also works up here in factor 7 and that would be the tissue factor now the more that this thing is excited on either side, whether it be an internal pathway or an externally from the tissues, we form clots faster. But once the thrombin, fibrin, polymer and the clot has been formed, this down here is tissue plasminogen activator and it is essentially the dynamite. So if I activate plasminogen and it forms plasma, the clot breaks down. Heparin, general knowledge drug, right here only, exerts direct effects on the blood coagulation by enhancing the inhibitory actions of antithrombin-3 on several factors essential to normal blood clotting, thereby blocking the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin and fibrinogen to fibrin. It does not lyse existing thrombi, but may prevent their extension and propagation or their more and more expansion of the actual clot. Also inhibits the formation of new clots. Again, general knowledge drug. Electrolyte modifiers. Calcium, chloride, gluconate, uh, magnesium sulfate, and sodium bicarbonate. Is what we're so calcium chloride um, is a um, required ion. Um, this works off of the slow channels in the heart. Whenever we're looking at the cardiac cycle, we're going to kind of take a look at that here for a second. Your body has to achieve an action potential. So after that action potential is achieved, then the contraction occurs. Now in this area here, we generally get a slow channel influx of calcium. And what that does for the cardiac cycle is it essentially makes it more efficient to where it something as small as your fist like your heart has the ability to contract enough force to supply blood to the whole body. Uh, calcium causes a significant increase in myocardial contractile and ventricular automaticity. It is used as an antidote for some electrolyte imbalances. Uh, stabilizing the cardiac rhythm in settings such as hyperkalemia and that's why we use it in hyperkalemia. This up here is because it allows the heart to function in a hyperkalemic environment and to minimize the side effects of calcium channel blocker overdose. The action of calcium chloride are similar to those of calcium gluconate since it ionizes more readily, it is more potent than calcium gluconate. So if we want to get the job done, calcium chloride would be the one. Adult dose on this is going to be 500 to 1,000 milligrams IV over 5 to 10 minutes. Pediatric dose, infants, less than 75 milligrams. Um, IV may be repeated as necessary and these guys would probably be in a calcium channel blocker overdose scenario or they could be hyperkalemic. You would probably have to call uh, for that. Um, children which would be years old, 75 to 519 milligrams, uh, IV may be repeated as necessary. Contraindications of this, calcium chloride is contraindicated in ventricular fibrillation any ventricular dysrhythmia that this patient is in whatsoever, calcium chloride is contraindicated in. Very simply, if they're in VFib, VTAC, or anything like that, you do not administer calcium chloride to them. If they're in PEA or systole, and you think that hyperkalemia might have got you there, 
if you have an etiology protocol to initiate calcium on, then you can give it, or a causes protocol. It should be used with caution in patients taking digoxin, as it may precipitate toxicity. Safe use in pregnancy and children has not been established, though in indicated conditions, the benefit may outweigh the risks. Pharmacokinetics. Onset of calcium chloride is immediate. Duration is not established because it is direct calcium ion. And then it is excreted and eliminated in the urine. Calcium gluconate. General knowledge. So I need you to please pay attention to this section. Bone mineral component cofactor in enzymatic actions, essential for neurotransmission, muscle contraction, and may signal uh, transduction pathways. Adult dose on this, same 50 to 1,000 uh, IVIO. Magnesium sulfate, primary care drug, acts as a physiological calcium channel blocker and blocks neuromuscular transmission. When given parentally, it acts as a CNS depressant and also the depressant of smooth muscle, skeletal, and cardiac muscle function. Anticonvulsant properties by decreasing the amount of acetylcholine liberated from motor nerve terminals, thus producing peripheral neuromuscular blockade. Now, we use this in multiple things. One of the things that we use this in is polymorphic VTAC or torsades to points. Reason being is because the hearts got wild, and there's a polymorphic VTAC kind of looks like that so that there's this wave pattern to it. If we think that torsades is present by the by looking at the EKG then that gives us clinical indication to initiate magnesium sulfate. Mag sulfate is used as a smooth muscle relaxant. It is also used in status asthmaticus as a smooth muscle relaxant. It is also used in preeclampsia and eclampsia whenever seizures are present or preterm labor because it is a smooth muscle relaxant. Adult dose on this, one to two grams over one to two minutes. Pediatric dose is going to be 25 to 50 milligrams per kilogram IV over 10 to 20 minutes. Contraindication, do not administer magnesium sulfate to patients with hyper or high magnesium levels, hypocalcemia, or heart and heart block. Pharmacokinetics, onset is immediate, duration is 30 minutes, and excreted in the urine. Hydrogen ion excretion, the important things on this one is we are essentially going to talk about this little guy right here within the next couple slides. Your body and your kidneys produce and filter and adjust the amount of sodium bicarbonate present. It is the made, one of the major buffer systems of the body. If you do not have bicarbonate or enough bicarbonate in your body, very simply, you can and will go into metabolic acidosis. And that's what this explains. Just a quick overview. Please look over the AMP slide sets if you're unfamiliar with this terminology. Decreasing pH or decreasing hydrogen levels. Homeostasis is disturbed. Uh, normal generation of metabolic acids occur. And what happens is, is now we have an abundance. So it essentially, whatever the cause that got us here, inadequate bicarbonate ion or overproduction of hydrogen or other acids, other third party acids not related to CO2, increases the acidity level and decreases the pH. In that case, we would need to administer some bicarbonate and we have it in the form of sodium bicarbonate. Now very simply when applied in here the sodium kind of breaks off so you have bicarbonate it picks up extra hydrogen molecule makes this go away which is H2CO3 that's carbonic acid. The body can break down carbonic acid very easily to water and CO2 and it's a reversible action if you have an abundance of CO2 and water and you need more acid 
enzymatic action will turn it into carbonic acid to adjust your acid base balance. Metabolic alkalosis, very simply, is too much bicarbonate. The next question that should come out of your your mouth is, is why did we make too much bicarbonate? These are metabolic, not respiratory. So sodium bicarbonate is a PC drug. Very simply, it is a blood alkalizer. Uh, given an IV, immediately raises the pH, which would make it more alkalotic. A blood plasma by buffering the excess hydrogen ions. In, this, in a short time, the plasma alkali reserve is increased and excessive sodium bicarbonate ions are excreted in the urine, thus rendering the urine less acidic. This plays an important role in treating certain drug overdoses, particularly tricyclic antidepressants and barbiturates, and by speeding up excretion of the drug from the body. Adult dosing on this is one milliequivalent per kilogram IV bolus, and this should be given, and they can be followed by 0.5 milliequivalents per kilogram every 10 minutes during an arrest. Pediatric dose, one milliequivalent per kilogram as well per dose if ventilations are adequate. Now, why ventilations are adequate? Because whenever we put bicarbonate on board, enzymatic action will change it to CO2 on water, and we can eliminate the CO2 by providing adequate ventilations. Uh, diuretics, which means make you urinate more. Uh, Bumex and Lasix are the ones we're talking about. And both of them are working in the loop, which is down here. Again, this is the kidney chapter in AMP if you need uh, review on this. So essentially, if we keep sodium here, that more water, given the opportunity, would get back into the tubule and thereby become urine and that's what these diuretics essentially do. Um, Lasix, for furosemide, is potassium depleting and Bumex can be potassium depleting. We should definitely watch your potassium levels while taking those medications. So Bumex, general knowledge, just a mechanism of action on this because your patients may be taking it. Uh, Bumetidide inhibits the reabsorption of sodium and chloride in the kidneys. It increases the excretion of water, sodium chloride, magnesium, hydrogen, calcium, and potassium. Bumetidine causes renal and peripheral vasodilation, which may cause a temporary decrease in peripheral vascular resistance. Bumetidine causes diuresis and lowers the blood pressure. Very simple. I keep sodium in the tubule and water will, I will make more yarn. Lasix. Uh, this is a primary care drug, so we're going to talk about it all. Generic on this is furosemide, and the trait is going to be Lasix. Mechanism of action, furosemide is a rapid-acting, potent sulf sulfonamide, lube diuretic, and antihypertensive with pharmacological effects. It uses most identical to those of erythrocytic acid. The exact mode of action is not clearly defined. Renal vascular resistance decreases, and renal blood flow may increase during drug administration. It inhibits reabsorption of sodium and chloride primarily in the loop of Henle and also in the proximal and distal renal tubule. So very simply, I keep sodium in the tubule, it becomes urine. Adult dose is 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram, generally capping that at 20 to 40 milligrams by slow IV bolus over 1 to 2 minutes. If no response, you can double that dose to 2 milligrams per kilogram over 1 to 2 minutes. Uh, and the onset time on this is going to be about five minutes and the duration is going to be about two hours. So you give them five to ten minutes and they're not making any urine or anything like that, you can double the dose. Generally speaking, we'll give them 15 to 30 for this just to let it soak in and then treat their shortness of breath if, if necessary symptomatically. Pediatric dosing. Pediatrics, one milligram per kilogram by IV bolus over one to two minutes may increase it to one milligram per kilogram every two hours. Do not exceed six milligrams per kilogram. Contraindications, do not administer furosemide to patients with hypovolemia, hypotension, hypokalemia, suspected hypokalemia if the patient is on long-term diuretic therapy or if the EKG shows prominent P waves, diminished T waves, or the presence of a U wave. Now, from 12 lead, you'll notice that the presence of a U wave actually creeps into the T wave, and that would be significant of hypokalemia. 
or if they are hypersensitive, hypersensitive to the furosemide. Pharmacokinetics, on set of five minutes, duration two hours, and is eliminated in the urine. Thrombolytic therapy. Very simply, this is the dynamite that I spoke of earlier. We're going to talk about activase, retoplase, and streptokinase. Very quickly and simply. If you make the active form of plasmin, the clot is going to bust apart. So these medications are going to be TPA or tissue plasminogen activators are going to activate the plasminogen so that we form the active form of plasmin. And that's going to break down the fibrin and essentially break down the clot. Activase, primary care drug. Generic on this is going to be Alteplase or TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, and the trade is going to be Activase. Mechanism of action binds to fibrin in the thrombus, causing a conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. Remember I told you that these walls already had dynamite in them. This conversion results in local fibrinolysis and, dec and a decrease in circulating fibrinogen. The thrombus is dissolved, which may limit the size of the infarction due to a myocardial infarction. Dosing here, we can do this two ways, and the first way I'm going to talk about is a total of 100 milligrams IV over three hours and to administer as follows. 60 milligrams over the first hour. Administer the first 6 to 10 milligrams of the 60 milligrams by IV bolus over 1 to 2 minutes and the rest by IV infusion over the first hour. 20 milligrams by infusion over the second hour and 20 milligrams by infusion over the third hour. That's one way. Or you can administer it this way. A total of 1.25 milligrams per kilogram IV over 3 hours as follows. In the first hour, 0 0.75 milligrams per kilogram. In the second hour, 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. And in the third hour, 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. And these would be all over an hour. Pediatric dose not recommended in the outer hospital use. Contraindications. If they have any active bleeding, please do not give them a clot buster. History of cerebrovascular accident, more specifically CVA, or more especially a brain bleed. Intracranial or spinal trauma with surgery within the past two months. Severe uncontrolled hypertension or bleeding disorders. Pharmacokinetics, onset 30 minutes, half life 72 minutes, and is excreted in the urine. Retivase, retiplace, this is going to be general knowledge. Mechanism of action is what I want you to know on this. Plasminogen to plasmin. Breaks down the cell. Streptokinase, also general knowledge. Again, mechanism of action. Activates plasminogen, then acts to dissolve fibrin clarin. Streptokinase develops thrombi emboli, preserving left ventricular function after an MI. So if I activate plasminogen, I'm going to get plasmin. Vasopressors. These are the ones we're going to talk about. Dopamine, dobutamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and vasopressin. Now, these are kind of all of them thrown into the mix here. We are trying to target, if we'll remember from neurophysiology and AMP, that alpha and betas are where we're trying to target. Now, in both of these, I have an alpha-1 and an alpha-2. The one that I got my arrow pointer to here is the alpha-1, and this is the alpha-2. Each one of these things do its own specific job. Beta-1, which is probably where I have my uh, arrow pointer to here, and then the beta-2, which is on smooth muscle, right? Uh, beta-2 in the lungs, uh, the uterus, areas like this, smooth muscle. So I give somebody a beta-2 agonist, it dilates smooth muscle. Well, this is also with dopamine figured into it. Now, what dopamine does is it's a precursor to epinephrine and norepinephrine. The more dopamine I put on board, the more dosing or the more bang for my buck that I get from epinephrine and norepinephrine because they start pumping this out. However, I re still require epinephrine and norepinephrine to make this dopamine work. So dopamine is a precursor to epinephrine and norepinephrine. The epinephrine and norepinephrine, speaking of, comes along and hits these receptor sites. And then I get my product. If I hit the beta receptor site, I'm going to get harder, faster, stronger. If I hit the beta 2 receptor site, 
I'm going to get bronchial dilation or smooth muscle dilation. If I hit the alpha-2 receptor site, this is going to inhibit the release of norepinephrine. So we have some medications that actually all that they do is inhibit or excite. They inhibit norepinephrine, but they do this by exciting alpha-2. First drug, dobutamine. Generic on this is going to be dobutamine, and the trade is going to be Dobutrex. Mechanism of action. Dobutamine produces its inotropic effect by acting on beta receptors and primarily on myocardial alpha adrenergic receptors. It increases cardiac output, positive inotropic effect, and decreases pulmonary wedge pressure and total systemic vascular resistance with comparatively little or no effect on the blood pressure or heart rate. So what this does is this makes the heart beat harder, not faster. Adult dose on this is going to be 2 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute. Pediatric dose is going to be the same, 2 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute. It is important to remember when utilizing a vasopressor. The ideal patient that this would be used on would be a patient that had isolated heart failure but had a normal tensive blood pressure. So blood pressure is 130 over 70 and they have pulmonary edema from left ejection fraction problems fluid building up in the lungs. So if I could increase the cardiac output of the left ventricle, that might clear the pulmonary trunk because I had more pressure. So dobutamine may be given to that type of patient. Contraindications, hypersensitivity to dobutamine or its bisphilates. Uh, pharmacokinetics, onset 10 minutes, duration is 10 minutes, and it's excreted in the urine. Dopamine, another vasopressor. Uh, generic on this is going to be dopamine, and the trait is going to be inotropin. Mechanism of action. Dopamine is a naturally occurring neurotransmitter and immediate precursor of norepinephrine. Its major cardiovascular effects are produced by the direct action on alpha and beta adrenergic receptors and on specific dopamine receptors in the mesenteric and renal vessels. This is dose-dependent. Please remember what I'm fixing to tell you. 2 to 5 is a renal artery perfusion dose which means that it's going to dilate the renals. 5 to 10, you're going to get beta 1 response. Harder, faster, stronger. 10 to 15, you're going to finish off any beta 1 response you have and start getting an alpha 1 response. Anything greater than 15, and you're only going to get an alpha 1 response or vascular constriction. Adult dose, 2 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute, and so is the pediatric. Same dosing. Contraindications, tachydysrhythmia. So this one here isn't like dobutamine. This one here also makes the heart beat harder, faster, stronger. So if they're already running at 150 beats per minute and you give them dopamine, it's going to increase their heart rate. Phenochromocytoma, which is a catecholamine-producing tumor, we do not want them to have an extra supply of catecholamine or their own body's natural indigenous or it, it's um, the body's own natural catecholamines which would be the epinephrine and norepinephrine your kidneys make or hypersensitive, hypersensitive to the dopamine or its bis bisphilates. Pharmacokinetics on this are onset in five minutes and the duration is ten and this is excreted in the urine. Next drug on our list is epinephrine. This has multiple doses, so please pay attention. Please look, be sure you understand this drug. We give this a lot. Generic on this is going to be epinephrine, and the trade is going to be adrenaline. Mechanism of action. This is uh, an alpha and beta. Alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. I stimulate all of those simultaneously. Epinephrine is a naturally occurring catecholamine obtained from the animal adrenal glands, but is also prepared synthetically. Acting directly on both alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, it is the most potent activator of alpha receptors. Epinephrine imitates all actions of the sympathetic nervous system, except those on the arteri arteries of the face and sweat glands. Adult dose on this, in a cardiac full arrest, we give them a standard dosing of one milligram every three to five minutes. In, 
if we're mixing a drip, we add one milligram to a 500 mil add bag. That's the normal configuration for that. The the thousand to a 500 gives us two mics per mil. Please review the dose dilution if this is not making sense to you. And we essentially start them off at one mic per minute. Now, the general range for that is two to ten, and this would be for bradycardic individuals. Uh, adult hypotensive symptomatic sinus bradycardia, two to ten, again, mics per minute. And it's prepared the same way, 1,000 micrograms into 500 mils of fluid. Pediatric dosing on this, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of a 1 to 10,000 solution. Pretty much it is, as long as you grab the 1 to 10,000 or the 1 to 1,000 solution, is 0 0.1 milliliter. That's a lot easier to figure sometimes. If kiddo weighs five kilograms, then instead of figuring out 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram, I'm going to figure by 0 0.1 milliliter. So five times 0 0.1 is 0 0.5 mils. Now, it doesn't matter which concentration strength I grab. It just matters like the one to 1,000 is used across another tissue. Example, this would be down the tube sub-Q, intermuscular, the 1 to 10,000 is use IVIO and that's because it's dilute, it won't cause as much necrosis that way, which it still could, but less chance. Uh, contraindications, none during cardiopulmonary arrest, car cardiopulmonary arrest, otherwise do not administer epinephrine to patients hypersensitive to sympathomimetic amines. Pharmacokinetics, onset, is immediate duration is 5 to 10, and this is excreted in the urine. Norepinephrine, vasopressin, this is a major alpha-1 agonist. Um, generic on this is norepi, and the trade name is levofed. Norepinephrine stimulates primarily alpha adrenergic receptors to result in potent arterial and venous constriction. The action increases blood pressure, norepinephrine stimulates beta-1 adrenergic receptors to increase cardiac contractility and cardiac output. Uh, adult dose, begin IV infusion at 0 0.5 to 1 mic per minute, increase until there is a therapeutic effect while maintaining a blood pressure of about 90 millimeters of mercury is our goal here. Average infusion rate we should have is 2 to 12 mics per minute. However, if the patient is in refractory shock, we can probably go up to 30 on that. Pediatric dosing is going to be 0 0.05 to 2 mics per kilogram per minute. The difference between these two is one of them is a dose per minute, and the other one is weight dependent. IV maximum dose of 2 mics per kilogram per minute. Contraindications, do not administer norepinephrine to patients with hypotension caused by hypovolemia. If they are fluid low, be sure that they have adequate amounts of fluid on board. Myocardial ischemia or infarction. Do not administer norepinephrine uh, during pregnancy because of the decreased uterine blood flow. Presence of thrombosis, hypoxia, or hypersensitivity to norepinephrine or its bisphilates. Pharmacokinetics is onset in one to two minutes, and the duration is on at one to two minutes as well, excreted in the urine. Uh, vasopressin, how this medication works, is vasopressin works off of the vasopressor receptors, and that would be the ones that respond to antidiuretic hormone. If we stimulate both of them, it increases systemic vascular resistance and increases the blood pressure by vasoconstriction. Um, kidneys and the vessels are where who has the vasoreceptors on here. So as an alternate to epinephrine, the first 10 minutes, we can use vasopressin. Uh, it is a hormone, so it's in the form of units. Generic on this is going to be vasopressin, and the, the trade name is going to be patrescin. Mechanism of action, non-adrenergic peripheral vasoconstrictor administered during CPR. Vasopressin increases coronary perfusion pressure, vital organ perfusion, and cerebral oxygen delivery. 
Adult dose, cardiac arrest, one dose of 40 units IVIO in cardiac arrest. Note, epinephrine can be given every three to five minutes during the cardiac arrest as well. Um, pediatric dosing, current guidelines do not suggest to administer um, vasopressin to the pediatric patient, so it's kind of contraindicated. Contraindications on this in general are none during the cardiac arrest. Pharmacokinetics, half-life, 10 to 20 minutes, and is excreted in the urine. This is used in the AHA in the first 10 minutes and used once. So one unit, one dosing of vasopressin, 40 unit, one-time dose in the first 10 minutes of a full arrest. Other is going to be oxygen. Uh, primary care drug as well, mechanism of action on this is it increases the amount of supplied oxygen to your patient. It also depends on which delivery device you have chosen. Essentially, whenever we add two liters, it adds roughly 20% to the already 21% that we have in our atmosphere. Simple face mask on this, 40 to 60%. Venturi mask. And the reason that this is a little different is the Venturi mask is adjustable. So it's going to suck in some air from the outside sample as well. Um, partial rebreather, we increase more. Non rebreather up to 95%. BVM up to 90. Demand valve 100% because it's tapping the oxygen bottle. In conclusion, this chapter contains most, some of the most essential and frequently used medication in the out of hospital setting. Additionally, the guidelines, doses, and the drugs used in cardiovascular emergency are continuously changing. While it is a difficult task, EMS providers must attain an in-depth knowledge of these medications and remain current on new drugs, dosages, and guidelines as they evolve. References for this chapter were taken from Beck Pharmacology for EMS Providers, pages 103 and 125 at Del Mar Learning, and Brian Bledsoe, Pre-Hospital Emergency Pharmacology, 7th edition. These are various references that were used for the slides uh, and the explanation slides of what you have seen. If you have any questions concerning this video, please feel free to give me a call. My name is Roy Smith, smithr at imsa.net or 45219-7613. Thank you.